get it back, I would get it back in a second. In December of 1999, Bezos had been named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But now, just six months later, Wall Street was wondering whether Amazon was headed for bankruptcy. A brutal report issued by Lehman Brothers caused the company's stock to fall 19% in a single day. I happened to be with Bezos the very next day at a conference in Aspen, Colorado, and I watched him steadfastly defend his company in a series of TV interviews. It was undoubtedly the lowest point of his career, and the question was whether his defiance was a sign of braveness and farsightedness, or whether he was deep in denial. The answer was far from clear. In early 2001, Bezos laid off 1,300 employees in what seemed a tragic turnaround for a company that had only recently represented everything that was best about e-tailing. A decision like this is very painful uh, for everybody at Amazon.com, very distressing at a personal level. It's also clearly the right decision. 18 months after Black Friday, September 11th happened, thus bringing to a conclusive end the long boom that had buoyed the American and indeed the world economy during the 1990s. From its peak above 5,000, the NASDAQ had lost more than two-thirds of its value. Even the most venerable high-tech giants, such as Intel and Sun Microsystems, were now walking wounded, and countless dot-com wunderkinds were now pushing up the daisies. Webvan, dead. Excited Home, dead. Theglobe.com, Pets.com, Boo.com, dead, dead, dead. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross famously said that in the face of death, there are five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But when it comes to the demise of stock market bubbles, there's an additional stage that comes before acceptance, recrimination. The mourners feel ripped off by the deceased, so they look for someone else to blame, which in this case meant Wall Street. On behalf of irate shareholders, New York's then Attorney General and its current governor, Elliot Spitzer, launched a crusade to reform the IPO industry and punish its supposed villains. His most famous target was Martha Stewart, but coming in a close second was our old friend, Henry Blodgett. Obviously, people are angry. People lost a ton of money. Using the critical emails that Blodgett sent as evidence, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission charged Blodgett with civil securities fraud. He settled without admitting or denying the allegations and was banned from the securities industry for life. Unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of detail on the emails, but certainly at, from a, a larger perspective, yes, I, I rode the internet wave up incredibly. I was incredibly fortunate in terms of the timing of, of my being there, and I was optimistic about the right companies at the right time, and so I saw a tremendous benefit from the boom, and then I think I probably more than any other analyst felt the brunt of the crash, which was like hitting the rocks full speed. Five years later, the bitterness over the dot-com bubble has subsided. Acceptance has set in. But for most people looking back on it, the bubble still seems like a moment of temporary insanity in which lots of good people got fleeced by a bunch of digital future hustlers. All in all, a very bad thing. But there is, in fact, another school of thought, one imbued with a greater sense of historical perspective and economic logic, one that sees the bubble as having had its virtues and the pain it caused as the price we pay for progress. The great dot-com crash of 2000 and 2001 was indeed great by any standard. Some three and a half trillion dollars in paper wealth evaporated in the space of one year. But it was hardly a unique event. When the railway bubble popped, railroad stocks lost 85% of their value almost overnight. And the collapse of the automobile, canal, and telegraph bubbles caused panic and recession too. But out of those bubbles came mass communications and the road and railway networks that are so crucial to our daily lives. The same has proven to be the case with e-commerce. A jillion dumdum.coms may have perished, but a handful of companies have not only survived, but turned into hugely profitable behemoths. You could say, in fact, that Amazon and eBay are the Ford and GM of the web economy. What Amazon and what eBay did was fundamentally different, and they did it early, they did it aggressively, and they did it extremely well, recognizing that the customer experience was paramount. And that's why they exist today and are the global multinational corporations. 
The lessons of both eBay and Amazon, indeed, are that the most successful e-commerce companies did more than just use the web to sell stuff. They understood that you have to use it to give power to ordinary people in ways that are fundamentally different from the old top-down, one-way, one-dimensional, one-size-fits-all mass production ethos that dominated business in the pre-web economy. A business like eBay is all about empowering the people, regular people, to use the tools uh, in the way that they see fit. And then sort of, you know, stepping back, getting out of the way, and letting, letting the people run with it. But what about the losers, you might ask? Surely all the pain and suffering and the decimation of wealth outweighed the survival of a few perennials. At the depths of the crash, I put that question to Andy Grove, the legendary chairman of Intel. Grove is a congenital skeptic, and during the dot-com bubble, there'd been no louder naysayer. But now Grove argued that the bubble had actually been a good thing. What this incredible valuation craze did, he said, was draw untold sums of billions of dollars into building out the internet infrastructure. Everything from fiber optic cable to Amazon's customer database. And while that infrastructure would probably have been built anyway, he went on, it happened over five years instead of 15. A huge advantage to America and the world. Grove also made another argument, that the dot-coms had performed an invaluable service by putting the fear of God into brick-and-mortar firms, by forcing them to get serious about the web, to turn themselves into internet companies almost against their will. So the dot-coms didn't die in vain, I asked. No, Grove replied. The dot-coms threw themselves on the bonfire, but they created a bigger flame as a result. Many jobs were lost, you know, companies failed. But it's also true that out of that, many uh, new companies were created, became durable, and, and, and the economy was genuinely transformed. The concept of creative destruction is famous in economics, and it seems an apt description of what happened in the dot-com era and what's happening now. First a wave of innovation, then a financial mania, then a terrible crash, followed by a golden age built on what remains. Arising out of the dot-com ashes and the successes of Amazon and eBay are a new breed of companies run by a new breed of entrepreneurs. Who are these entrepreneurs? They're the people who were burned before, and so they have that, that experience to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes again. I think it's just, this is what the internet's all about. The internet's about connecting individuals or connecting individuals to information. Outside Silicon Valley, it's true. You won't find as much consensus that we're entering a digital golden age. But in a way, that may be the strongest testament to how far the web, and e-commerce in particular, have come in the past decade. The futurist John Seeley Brown once observed that when a technology achieves amenity, when it becomes ubiquitous and essential, it disappears, it becomes invisible. Think of electricity, think of airplanes and automobiles and air conditioning. Like the railroad tracks crisscrossing the country, the web is becoming the foundation of our economy, carrying us along to our destination so smoothly and efficiently, we don't even realize how fast we're moving.